Following a productive career as an artist, Eric Erickson graduated from the Vienna Psychoanalytic Institute in 1933. After arriving in the United States as one of the pioneer child analysts, he became a research fellow in neuropsychiatry at Harvard Medical School from 1934 to 1935. He then was appointed research assistant in psychoanalysis at the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine from 1936 to 1939. From 1939 to 1951, he served as research associate at the Institute of Child Welfare and lecturer in psychiatry at the University of California. From 1951 to 1960, he was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and also senior staff consultant at the Austin Riggs Center. Since 1960, he has been professor of human development and lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard University School of Medicine. Professor Erickson has reflected important new extensions of psychoanalytic theory in such books as Childhood and Society, Young Man Luther, A Study in Psychoanalysis and History, and Insight and Responsibility. His keen perceptions of the developmental cycle of man as well as his penetrating cross-cultural analysis continue to stimulate theory, research, and clinical practice to such a degree that he has been described as one of the most creative of the psychoanalytic contributors. It was a great pleasure to have conducted this interview with him at the University of Houston. Professor Erickson, could you tell us a little bit of how you happened to get involved in the psychoanalytic movement? I don't know whether I'm... I'm boasting or I'm uh, apologizing when I say I came to psychoanalysis really from art. In those days, uh, Sigmund Freud was quite eager to have some people, not the majority of psychoanalytic candidates, come from non-medical fields. I think he always felt that psychoanalysis was something in between science and art. And while he made many scientific and even scientist formulations, I think the artful part of his work always stands out in comparison with us. And you may remember that his early case histories were, in fact, uh, accused of being reading like novels. Yes, that's right. So I cannot deny that this is what first attracted me to it. And I also was very much impressed when I first met Freud with his great understanding of art. That's kind of interesting because um, this aesthetic interest area of Freud, uh, I guess, comes out of several points of his work, doesn't it? There's this no, great appreciation so. in art. And to I me, it is a continuous part of his work. Uh, uh, were there, by the way, quite a number of artists like yourself who were attracted to the psychoanalytic movement? Offhand, I don't know another artist, but several art historians. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Bettelheim was yes. one. I think Ernst Chris, was, uh, w w who was one of my teachers in Vienna, was then a curator in the art museum. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. Yeah. So you, as an artist then, became familiar with Freud's work and could see that this opened horizons. Now, what, was, what happened after this? Well, in those days, I... Uh, tried to, uh, to make a living from being a teacher. And I was really, uh, well, if you're interested in the quite private aspects of it, I was, uh, for one summer, I met, I had an old friend, uh, Peter Blows, who is now a psychoanalyst in New York, who was a tutor in a family that was very close to the Freuds, and that is the Burlingham family. Uh, Dorothy Bellingham is also now with Anna Freud in London. And he asked me to, to be the tutor of these children for one summer in the Austrian Alps, and that is how I met the Freud. And in those days, of course, I was very diff different from today, where one has to apply and go through all kinds of complicated procedures. In those days, the leading analysts picked from their acquaintances, people who they thought had some, I don't know what to call it, psychoanalytic sense, who might be gifted, and especially Anna Freud at that time looked for people who might 
develops the field of child analysis, which is the first I uh, specialized in. In those days, that was uh, still a rarity, wasn't it? People who were actually applying themselves to child analysis. When I came to Boston in 1933, I was the first psychoanalyst for children. That was, that was quite a new field. Freud presented a very, very important model of psychosexual development, pointing out that we have to understand uh, a good deal of man's later life in view of the way he was able to resolve conflicts in his very early life. And it certainly seems that Freud uh, did not pay an awful lot of attention beyond these first five years of life. But certainly, it seems that you um, try to conceptualize these later periods as well as these earlier periods in somewhat more detail. I believe you call these the eight ages of man. The very first stage, of course, uh, Freud talked about an oral level uh, development, a very, very early uh, kind of a self-love or narcissistic level. And you also speak about an oral sensory level, which presumably is in the very, very early uh, years of life. But you have added what seems to be some character dimensions that you think evolve eventually from this early level. You talk about basic trust versus basic mistrust being related to this oral sensory level. Now, could you uh, tell us a little bit about just what you mean by basic trust versus basic mistrust as it evolved from this oral level? Mm -hmm. Well, we should um, remember here that this is not just a matter of a simple shift of focus, uh, but um, that one is built on the other. Now, you undoubtedly remember that what Freud first was very much concerned with was to find to find uh, experiences in life in which he could find quantities of something. You remember he, wor he began to work during the period when the transformation of energy was in the center of uh, scientific right. method. So to him, the origins and the transformations of sexual energy it was not a matter of, of preoccupation with sexuality, but it seemed to him the most likely area in which you could find quantities which arise out of the body chemistry and are translated into drives. And of course, his great finding was that sexuality does not begin in puberty, but that sexuality is gradually built up in stages. And I mean, I don't have to recapitulate this. Yes, of course. See, the main point is that um, we later on were concerned not just with the question of uh, what does orality contribute to sexuality. And I don't have to go into that, that it contributes uh, normal activities, perverse activities, neurotic repressions, all kinds of things. What we were interested in is what um, orality may contribute to the child's psychosocial development. In other words, the orality takes place in relationship to the mother who feeds and who reassures and who cuddles and keeps warm. That's what I mean by sensory, I would even add kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, um, I think was interested, in fact, in two things. One is what kind of a mode of behavior is established in orality? Then I call that the incorporated mode. Mm -hmm. What you learn first in life is to take in. Mm -hmm. But as you take in, and take in with your mouth, with your eyes, with your senses, you can see that a child, even with his eyes, tries to incorporate, mm -hmm. and then to remember, and then to recognize, and all of this. So what uh, seemed important was what contribution is that to psychosocial hmm. education. And there I felt that the first basic psychosocial attitude to be learned is that you can trust your mother, that she will come back and feed you, that you can trust she will feed you the right thing in the right quantity at the right time, that when you're uncomfortable she will come and uh, make you comfortable and so on. This is what I mean by basic trust. You see, in animals, this is all given instinctively. Mm -hmm. 
In man, it has to be learned, and a mother has to uh, teach it, and then mothers of different cultures and classes and, and races teach that in a different way. This is worth seeing. But mistrust is just as important. In fact, if you don't mind my, yes. my uh, mm. griping for a moment, <laughs> uh, it happens so easily that when this is quoted, people take away mistrust, doubt, shame, and all of these things, and think I'm merely establishing an achievement scale. First, you must have trust. Mistrust is very, the ratio of trust and mistrust is our basic social attitude. We do this constantly. If we walk, if we enter somewhere, we have to differentiate now. Can we trust or mistrust? And we, mistrust meaning the recognition of danger, the anticipation of discomfort, and so on. So these two things, that these are two things, is very basic to the whole scheme. Yeah. You answered uh, our question concerning the very first stage of man. Building on the foundation of Freud, you've introduced the important dimension of social development, as you call it, psychosocial development. Uh, it's filling in a little bit of a gap in Freud's work in the sense that he did not really develop this uh, perhaps he might have if he continued working, but in his own work. Um, if I may say so, I, I now recognize in, for example, in his early dream reports, that in a sense he knew all this, but he had, uh, he had to establish one thing at a time. Yes. And his great contribution was psychosexuality. Yes. Now, I'm still talking about this first age, this oral sensory stage, which leads yeah. to basic trust and mistrust, as you explain it. Um, it's interesting that you tie in with this first oral sensory level, the virtue of hope. Now, uh, how do we move from then these uh, character patterns, trust, mistrust, to hope? To me, hope is a very basic human strength without which we couldn't be alive. You may remember Spitz's movies in which it is shown that children who give up hope because they have not enough loving, not enough stimulation, literally die. And uh, so to me, hope is a strength, and I use the word virtue, which has um, brought a lot of discomfort to a lot of people, because it reminds them of, of a mor moralism and moralistic, uh, see, because after all, religions quite understandably have concern, always concerned with themselves with hope as a basic uh, human attitude which must be restored by prayer, and um, so you know what great role hope plays in human life and in all religions. But it so happens there are enough people who consider something like that theology, but not psychology. Well, I, of course, was interested in it. Why should religions feel this is so absolutely basic? And so I call it virtue, in a, but in an old sense. Virtue is something which at one time merely meant strength and not goodness, not niceness. Mm -hmm. In fact, I might, I might say that uh, in old English, uh, virtue was even the strength of a drink. Mm -hmm. You could say that the whiskey that stood around too long has lost its virtue. That's mm -hmm. what they said in the olden days. So mm -hmm. this is what I mean, something that animates, that gives strength. And animals, of course, are born with that. But man, because of that struggle between trust and mistrust, uh, in him it has to be developed. I see. Now, the second stage, of course, you refer to as the muscular anal stage. And, of course, here is where you introduce the uh, possibilities of emerging from here, the psychosocial development, autonomy versus shame and doubt. I think those who are um, uh, familiar with Freudian theory have always thought of the anal level fixation.